Now, as if poor Buchanan didn't have enough problems, in the fall of 1857, there begins a serious economic downturn, the so-called Panic of 1857. There had been a long period, as I said last time, of economic prosperity and growth, much of it fueled by gold coming into the economy from California. The California gold rush and its aftermath had poured money into the economy, which uh, it led to some inflation, but it also led to a great, you know, a lot of very low interest rates and the, oppor the opportunity for investment all over the place. Um, but as seems to happen eventually all the time, we saw it in 2008, bubbles eventually burst, right? And a kind of investment bubble developed in, in the eight, late eight, mid 1850s, a lot of land speculation, a lot of uh, excessive loans by banks. We've heard about that more recently. And um, all it needed was a, you know, a little needle to prick this bubble or this balloon, and that came from Europe in the form of the Crimean War, which Americans had nothing to do with, really. But um, the United States at that time was still what we would call today an emerging economy. In other words, if you read, I don't know, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, you'll see a lot about the emerging economies today, whether it's China, Brazil, um, some of the others, Indonesia, Turkey. Um, and their problems right now, their problems are stemming from nothing to do with them, but the a slowdown in China is leading to less demand for uh, raw materials from some of these countries. The policy of uh, the Federal Reserve of cutting back on their stimulus uh, is uh, frightening people from investing. It, 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 my main point is these emerging economies are very dependent on what happens in the metropolis far away. And the United States was very dependent on what happened in England. The pound was the international currency. The dollar today is the international currency. In the 19th century, the pound was the international currency. So when fluctuations in the pound rippled out across the whole world. And the um, Crimean War cut Amer demand in Europe for American farm goods which, and disrupted trade, particularly between the North and England. And, um, led to a kind of a contraction of investment and um, people calling in loans and collapses of things that have been bubbles. It, it's all complicated to go into, but the main point is um, it led to, some, to unemployment, rising unemployment in eastern cities. It led to um, bankruptcies of many businesses in the old Northwest, farmers uh, finding it difficult to pay their mortgages. Um, it, it, wasn't a seri it wasn't the most serious economic down. It was one of the less serious economic downturns of the 19th century. But nonetheless, it had some uh, effect for a year or so. But its main impact, from our point of view, was political. In the North, it revived the demand for the Homestead Act. That is to say, people who lost their jobs let the federal government give people land so they can get out of their position as wage earners, etc. It put the homestead question back on the national agenda, now linking these questions of free soil and free labor. To protect free labor, let's have a, Now, the homestead is a policy Northern Democrats and Northern Republicans both support. And the South is opposed to it because they don't want to settle the West with all these free farmers. So that is a sectional issue. It also leads to demands, particularly in Pennsylvania, for a high protective tariff to help these industries, but that's not really a sectional issue as much as an east-west issue. Most of the people in the further west, north or south, don't want it. But it puts some of these economic questions back on the, um, on the national agenda, and which will help the Republican Party in 1860. But in the south, the impact is even greater in a kind of negative way. The south does not suffer from the depression or the downturn of 1857. World demand for cotton remains high. Um, the world market for cotton is still good. The price of cotton, the price of slaves, does not collapse as some prices in the North did. There were few bank failures in the South, unlike in the North. There, there was still this continued flow of California gold. The South 
By the time prosperity returns in 1859, the South can say, we have saved the national economy. The South has rescued the nation from the economic downturn. In fact, it's in 1858 when Senator Hammond gives this speech in the Senate from South Carolina and uses this often quoted phrase, cotton is king. Cotton is king. No power on earth dares to make war on cotton. The supremacy of cotton is shown, he says, by the Panic of 1857 and the differential impact of the Panic North and South. The cotton is the strongest commodity in the world. The South doesn't have to worry about the economy in the way the North does. And this king cotton idea is part of a growing radicalism in the lower South. I'm not talking about Virginia. I'm talking about the deep South, the cotton South, the cotton kingdom. Ashworth talks about this. In a couple of weeks, we'll have chapters by Manisha Sinha on the reading list who talks a lot about this. The rise of a Southern radicalism. There'd always been Southern radicalism, but now it's tied in with the whole notion of a Southern nation, a distinctive Southern nation a slave empire. By now there are people actively working for secession, actively working for breaking up the Union. The Lecompton impasse strengthens that. We cannot trust the North anymore. Even our Democratic, Douglas, our great friend, Douglas had pushed through the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he turns on us. Who can we trust? The Supreme Court gives us the right to take slaves into the territories. It's abrogated by Congress. Slavery is not going out there. There's no future for the South and slavery in the Union, they say. But outside of the Union, a great slave empire can arise in the Caribbean, Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua. We can create, you know, they start looking southward for expansion, not westward. This is not a majority point of view in 1858, but it is now a growing and widely articulated a point of view. One man of the notion of a southern nation with distinct interests and a great prosperous future far better than in the United States. One of the illustrations of this is growing talk of reopening the international slave trade. Reopen the African slave trade to the south. Now some people are pushing this just because they know it will break up the Union. The North will never accept it. The civilized world will never accept it. The international slave trade has been condemned by this point by the entire world as a crime against humanity. As I've said, there are British ships and others patrolling the west coast of Africa to try, without 100% success certainly, to stop the international. And yet you have people in the south now saying, we have a right to bring in all the slaves we want. Um, and um, why? Who? In South Carolina, in Mississippi, in Louisiana. Well, first of all, what, what, why do we want to bring in more slaves? Well, first of all, the price of slaves has been rising dramatically. And um, slave ownership is being concentrated. It's harder and harder for ordinary white people to buy a slave because the price is... This is, this is promoted as a democratic idea. Let us democratize slave owning. We bring in more slaves, the price will go down, more people will be able to get slaves, therefore support for slavery will be widened and disseminated throughout the, um, throughout the society. Um, poor whites will be able to get into the slaveholding class. There are other arguments as well. Um, the three-fifths clause, if we stay in the Union, more slaves means more members of Congress, more electoral votes. The more slaves we have, the more political power we will have. Then there's this fear that the Upper South is going to somehow slip out of slavery. Remember, in Virginia, these places have been selling slaves for decades to the Lower South, and the thought is, well, if the slaves are brought in, it'll solidify slavery in the, in the Upper South. That very reason means it can never be accepted by the Upper South. Virginia's economy is tied into the selling of slaves to the Lower South. The idea that this is going to lower the price of slaves doesn't appeal to people who are selling slaves, right? 
Why should they want the price of slaves to be lowered when they're making profits off of selling slaves? Or anybody who owns a slave. What kind of argument is that? The value of the slave property in the South will be reduced by this policy. That doesn't seem like a winning argument. But nonetheless, it is, it is promoted um, avidly in some of the Southern press. But it is so out of line with civilized thought that the, the Constitution of the Confederate States of America prohibits the African slave trade. Even though secession is spurred by these people who are pushing this, they, when they form a new government, they realize they will never get any international recognition whatsoever if they don't continue the bar on the slave trade. Um, there are other, there's an, other examples in a second of this growing Southern radicalism of the late 1850s. Support for William Walker, the filibusterer. William Walker, a guy who, with a private army, invades Nicaragua, 1854-55, actually becomes the president of Nicaragua and reopens the African, reestablishes slavery there, which had been barred, and then reopens the African slave. Then the Nicaraguans kick him out eventually. But uh, he's a hero in the Lower South. He's, uh, he's violating 50 laws of the United States. You're not allowed to raise a private army in the United States and go and invade some other country. But um, he's feted in, you know, in the Southern press as, as a, you know, a hero of, of, of uh, Southern interests. And finally, early in 1860, Jefferson Davis introduces in the Senate a series of resolutions saying this is now the Southern position. We demand that the nation adopt this position, otherwise the nation will be broken up. What is it? A slave code for the territories. Congress must pass laws guaranteeing slavery in all the territories of the United States. This is obviously a repudiation of the Republican position. It's also a repudiation of Douglas, of popular sovereignty. No more is there going to be a decision. All the subsequent territories must be slave territories, according to um, Davis's resolution. All this reinforces Northern fears about the slave power and its, and its aspirations. All this enhances the possibilities of the Republican Party. What the Republicans need in 1860 is a candidate who can unite the party and carry the lower north to victory. And next week we'll see how they find him, Abraham Lincoln. So see you then. <laughs>